Hello, welcome to How to Change the World, a class with a bold title and a uh, challenging series of assignments and a uh, great ambition to work together to see what we can do to instigate positive change uh, around the world. This course has its origins in a collaboration uh, with the Social Good Summit. You can read more about the partners for that summit uh, on the Coursera syllabus page. Uh, but I was interested in participating in this because I've done some online teaching with Coursera before, although my teaching uh, is in the realm of history, philosophy, and literature. I'm the president of uh, Wesleyan University, and I uh, do a lot of teaching in, in history and philosophy. When I heard about the Social Good Summit, I began to think about how the work I do as a teacher and the work we do at Wesleyan might be connected more directly to actions people could take in the world that had to do with some of the most pressing global challenges. And so uh, talking with our partners at the 92nd Street Y and at Mashable and the United Nations Foundation and the Gates Foundation at Ericsson and several other uh, partners, uh, we decided to try to create out of the Social Goods Summit um, a uh, massive open online course that would introduce students to some of the great players in the world around these issues of poverty, climate change, health care, women and activism, education and social change some of the people doing some very interesting things out in the world today. We have some videos about them or talking with them. Uh, and uh, also to provide some basic information in regard to these key themes. So I am studying with you. I, unlike the other course I give where I'm actually um, talking about my considered views on the topic of the modern and the postmodern that I've been working on for a long time, in this class, I will be studying along with you. I will be um, uh, uh, doing the reading, talking to major figures in the field, uh, introducing you and, um, and learning myself about some of the things um, we might do uh, to make a positive difference. So it's exciting for me because I feel, although I am the, the professor in this class, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the, your guide in this uh, arena, uh, I'm also uh, a student in this class uh, uh, learning with you uh, as we go along. This is a long tradition at Wesleyan uh, where, where, I, where I was a student many years ago and I'm, as I said, now the president. Uh, we believe that uh, active learning is something that professors do and not just that students do. So uh, it's a real treat for me to be learning with you. The subject of the, of the, of the course uh, is uh, obviously very pressing uh, because we have um, some of these really enormous challenges. But in our first week, we're going to try to um, talk conceptually about what a social good is, how to define it, how do we think about uh, goods that are non-exclusive, goods that can't be sold, goods that aren't easily or perhaps can't be privatized, goods that are social, that is, that they belong to us in common, rather than uh, goods that are private. And we'll talk to different people about um, how those kinds of goods, uh, those kinds of values, those kinds of properties, those kinds of resources um, uh, can be sustainably used, can be used with justice, can be put into the service of humanity rather than into the uh, to the, for the disservice uh, of humanity. So our task this week is to really think conceptually about what a non-exclusive good is or what a social good uh, is. And so it's a little bit more theoretical than some of the other readings we'll do uh, and other assignments we'll do. Uh, just one more word about the structure of the course. Uh, we will um, each week have three uh, sub-themes. What do we know? Why should we care? And the third one, what can we do? And uh, so we'll try to give uh, both uh, factual and conceptual information in the what do we know stream, and then talk about what is at stake in the issue and what is um, gripping for us humanly and why we should care. And uh, in the third 
a stream, uh, what are some of the things one can do, either as individuals or in groups? And we'll give assignments in this MOOC that, that will instigate, I hope, some collaboration and instigate actions, not on behalf of a particular political party or particular ideology, but actions that uh, would have an effect on the problems we've identified uh, in that week's work. We start this week with uh, what is a social good, and we're going to go back uh, decades to work by Garrett Hardin, uh, a uh, uh, he was, wrote a very influential piece uh, in Science Magazine, uh, which was called uh, The Tragedy of the Commons. And uh, I thought this would be a good place uh, to start uh, because uh, Garrett Hardin identified uh, a, a significant um, uh, game theory or economic or formal problem about what happens when people are sharing a resource but are motivated by self-interest. Uh, what happens, he says, is a tragedy. What happens is a tragedy. So when Hardin started his work uh, uh, on the tragedy of the commons, we're in the mid-1960s, publishes the article in 1968, and for him, the, 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 the overriding issue was population growth. He just really thought that the planet could sustain a certain number of people uh, and, and, and we were in danger because of population growth of exceeding the number of people that the planet could sustain. And he wondered whether there were mechanisms uh, for controlling population growth that would be acceptable to people uh, or whether there was um, uh, uh, a, a, an inexorable uh, tragedy in the making, something that would necessarily... Uh, result in, uh, in a disaster for many people because of the tendencies that could not be stopped in population growth. And so uh, this is, again, in, in, the late in the late 1960s. And what, what Hardin wanted to emphasize, and I just give you a quote from, from the uh, essay, the population problem, he wrote, has no technical solution. It requires a fundamental extension of morality. That's, I think, very interesting. I think a fundamental extension of morality. So it's not just about more food. It's not just about better transportation. It's not just about controlling waste uh, or pollution. It's about a fundamental extension of morality. People have to change, Hardin thought, in order to get out of the vice grips of this dilemma. What is the dilemma he identified? It's, it's pretty simple. I mean, there's some animated um, uh, clips actually on uh, YouTube that we will give you links for that you can actually see this <laughs> played out graphically, but it's pretty simple. Imagine, uh, Hardin says, a, a pasture land uh, where uh, the, a community has uh, rights to come and have their livestock graze on this pasture land. Everybody comes with uh, their cow, um, and according to uh, the, a notion of individual motivation that Hardin traces back to Adam Smith, among others, each person with his cow is actually uh, motivated, has an interest in bringing another cow. So if I think that Jerry over there is bringing three cows and I only have one cow, I'm thinking, well, gee, isn't it in my interest to get the most out of this pasture land to bring as many cows, if not more cows, than Jerry. So I go back and I find a way to get another cow. I bring the other cow. Jerry's looking over at me. Hey, what? That guy Roth's bringing extra cows. I should bring an extra cow. Now somebody comes along probably at this point and says, hey, we've got too many cows on this darn pasture land. But what Hardin points out is, is if we are motivated by uh, individual interest, individual self-interest, uh, we uh, will continue to try to get as many cows on our, that pasture land as possible, with, of course, the predictable result that eventually we will destroy the pasture land that is sustaining, that had been sustaining all of us. And that this, um, as long as we're motivated by self-interest, that this is going to end up tragically because we will we will destroy the resource that we are competing about. The competition for resources 
will destroy the resources as long as there's no regulation on the amount of use of those resources. And Hardin thinks that um, uh, this will require significant changes um, uh, to how we behave and how we're motivated, or how we're regulated, I suppose I should say, in order to avoid this tragedy. So uh, just to give you, um, again, some uh, quotations uh, from the reading, um, he's going back to Adam Smith and the notion uh, of individual interest in capitalism, and Hardin writes, if it is correct that we can assume that men will control their individual fecundity so as to produce the optimum population, if this is not correct, we need to examine our individual freedoms to see which ones are defensible. In other words, um, we have to control how many children we have, how many cows we bring to the pasture. Uh, otherwise, we are going to create disaster. But in fact, given Smith's presuppositions, which Hardin tends to share, Hardin tends to share, given those presuppositions, um, uh, we will, through our freedoms, create disaster. Now, you can think of this in population growth, fecundity. You can think of it in pasture land. Obviously, you can think of it in terms of uh, fishing. You know, if we all start f fishing as much as possible because of our own self-interest, eventually we will destroy um, the, 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 the uh, species of fish that we are trying to use as a resource. And, of course, the, the perhaps the most dramatic um, uh, resource on our, our horizon that we have been destroying in this way uh, is the atmosphere. That is, by dumping carbon uh, and other uh, pollutants into the atmosphere uh, uh, in order to pursue self-interest, we are destroying the very resource that keep us, keeps us alive. This is why he calls it a tragedy. Uh, uh, he, he quotes uh, William Foster Lloyd, uh, the essence of dramatic tragedy is not unhappiness, Lloyd wrote in the 18th century. Uh, tragedy, the essence of tragedy resides in the solemnity of the remorseless working of things. I, I think that's a, isn't that a great phrase, the solemnity of the remorseless working of things. And I, I, when I read that, I thought, gosh, this is in 1968, but doesn't it sound so much like the, the rhetoric you hear around climate change today? That is, there's nothing we could do about it. We're just, you know, there's no chance of changing because, because you offer me this rhetoric, if even if I change in my country, let's say the United States, another country is dumping all kinds of carbon in it and profiting and developing from it. Developing countries say to the developed world, well, you guys have been dumping stuff into the atmosphere for 100 years. Now you want to control it when we need to dump stuff into the atmosphere to have economic development. Because nobody wants to be the, the, the fool who stops bringing a cow to the pasture, right? While everybody else is profiting. Nobody wants to be the fool who stops economic development uh, in order to preserve the atmosphere if everybody else is dumping in the atmosphere anyway. This is the remorseless working of things that destroys the very resources that we are trying to exploit. Um, and Hardin's thought that remorseless working of things uh, uh, makes for a tragedy. So um, uh, he, he goes on in really prescient ways uh, in this short essay to talk about how almost biologically, almost biologically, we deny this. We, we are, um, we are um, prone to say, well, the pasture will not run out uh, you know, that quickly, or people are lying about the pasture running out. I can bring my cow. It's okay. The climate isn't really changing. Poverty isn't getting worse because of, demo, uh, because of population growth. We deny these things because it's easier to continue going along with our self-interest or what seems to be our self-interest than to recognize a long-term problem. Uh, natural selection, uh, he writes, favors the forces of psychological denial. Isn't that interesting? Natural selection favors the forces of psychological denial because as an individual, if I deny there's a problem, I continue to profit as an individual, for at least for a while, at least for a while. And before there's a lot of pressure on the pasture, I can keep doing it, I can keep exploiting it. It's only when there are a lot more people dumping a lot more stuff or having more and more animals graze in that pasture, only when it builds up to a critical point 
does this natural selection towards denial become very, very counterproductive. The individual, Hardin wrote, benefits as an individual from his ability to deny the truth, even though society as a whole suffers. That's really interesting, I think. The individual benefits as an individual from his ability to deny the truth. So people say, well, I'm not going to recycle. It's such a pain. I'm not going to cut back on my energy use. Why should I cut back? The other people aren't cutting back. Right? You've heard that. All the, how many times have you heard that? Why should I do something about poverty uh, when all these other people aren't doing anything about poverty? Why should I do something about health care when other people um, are not um, uh, doing something about health care for the poor? Uh, as an individual, it looks like I'm profiting. And so uh, as an individual, um, uh, uh, the product of natural selection, we, we tend to deny the long-term consequences of our action. There are really two possibilities to deal with this tragedy of the commons, um, uh, and, and Hardin acknowledges both of them. One is private ownership, and the other uh, is um, some kind of public ownership. The people who really think that the moral of the story is that you should have less government think that the, only through private ownership, if somebody owns the pasture, they're going to try to take care of its long-term uh, uh, health. And only if somebody really owns it will they be responsible for its long-term health and make sure, for example, you ration use of the pasture. The problem with this is that uh, private owners don't often look at a very, very long time horizon, and uh, it's in their individual interest to exploit it before they sell it. And so that may not work so well. The second option is some kind of government ownership. But government ownership can seem tyrannical, um, and furthermore, government ownership is usually overseen by bureaucrats who have no individual's interest in optimizing the performance of the resource they are paid to protect. So I'm here with Professor Donald Moon of the Government Department at Wesleyan University. We're going to be talking this morning about what is a social good. The uh, class here, uh, How to Change the World, comes out of the Social Good Summit that uh, took place in New York in the early fall. And uh, we want to talk this morning a little bit about the concept of social good, how it's related to private good, common good, terms that have a long uh, history in political theory and philosophy. And uh, Professor Moon uh, teaches courses in political theory here at Wesleyan, and um, thank you for joining me this morning. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So I thought we'd start off with this idea of social good and uh, um, its contrast with uh, private good and uh, its connection to notions like common good. This, these terms go back a long way in political theory, don't they? Well, for sure. I mean, you can find them in the, in the first great classic of, of political philosophy, uh, the Plato's Republic, where there's a, it opens with this question about whether justice is a private good for the powerful or whether it's actually a, a genuine social good. Uh, and the whole point of Socrates' work in the Republic is to show us that there's a, 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 that if we understand our own private good properly, we will also understand that this is a social good, it's a virtue. And this is one of the themes of this class, especially as we start off this week, is the, uh, whether there's an inherent tension between self-interest or the pursuit of the private good and, and justice and, and the public good. And, and um, in the history of political theory, who would be uh, like the standard bearer for the, the emphasis on the private or uh, individual self-interest? And who would be, let's say, one of the standard bearers for the communitarian or the social dimension? Yeah, well, I mean, we, I think Hobbes is probably the person to start with, though Mandeville's uh, Fable of the Bees is a, uh -huh. uh, a wonderful one. Uh, Tell us a little bit about, the, 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 for, for folks in this class who haven't done any political theory, t t tell us a little bit about the fable of the bees, uh, is, I, is one, if one could do that <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell. Well, uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea that Mandeville puts forward is the idea that if each person is pursuing his or her own private interest, uh, they be, will have an incentive to 
discover or learn what other people's interests are so that they can provide them with goods and services that they will pay them for. And so the suggestion that he's making, and it's formalized in Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand, is that by each person pursuing their own interests, they will act in ways that will generate the greatest good for the for the society as a whole. So that's another way of getting to that sweet spot where the self-interest is going to coincide with the common interest. Right. And, and so, and uh, you mentioned Hobbes as being another standard bearer for, that, for the self-interest part. Right, although Hobbes uh, is, focuses in particular on the problem of security. Right. And security is a social good because yes. You know, we have to buy our security together, so to yes. speak, in a world where people are roughly equal. I mean, if you're extraordinarily powerful, you might be able to be secure, but of course everybody else has been is totally insecure. Yes. <laughs> in a world where you have to sleep once in a while, uh, you can't uh, guarantee that you will be able to protect yourself against others, and therefore the only way you can provide security for yourself is through some kind of social organization. 